the book of Hebrews tonight. We have not yet begun actually looking at the text itself. We were still talking about some introductory facts about the book. We were talking last time about uh, who authored the book uh, as we're looking at it. And so there, there are a lot of different ideas that people have had about it. Uh, we, we discussed some of those and who it was that suggested uh, that they might be the authors. Uh, but we talked a little bit about uh, Paul. Paul is generally considered by so many people to be the author of this book. As I put it up here, he's the popular choice. And, and there, there are different reasons why. Some of the people don't believe that he's the author because, as I mentioned last week, they say that the style of the book, uh, the style of writing, is not the same as you see in those other books that we know that Paul wrote. And so they discount it for that reason. Although the professor that I had uh, in, at Harding uh, University, uh, where I made, I minored, and, and, and minors need to be emphasized, in, in the Greek language. Uh, and he believed that Paul wrote this book, and one of the reasons he believed was because of the style of it. He believed that the style was very much that of, the, of Paul. But we mentioned last week, one of the big reasons why most people reject uh, Paul, and really any apostle as being the author of the book, is because of some of the statements that are found in the book. I, I mentioned this last week. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. If you look at that text, it says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard Him? Whoever the author of this book is, he says that their knowledge of Christ was confirmed to them by those who had heard Christ. Well, that wouldn't apply to any of the apostles because all the apostles heard Christ uh, and, and they didn't have it revealed to them by somebody else. So they contend that the author of this book has to be somebody other than Paul or any of the other apostles that may have written it. Uh, and, and that's one of the ideas that they have for that. Uh, I'll tie in with this Galatians chapter 1, verses 11 and 12. We know Paul wrote the book of Galatians. And in this he says, But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man, for I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but it came through the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Paul says he didn't receive this gospel from man. Nobody delivered him. He hadn't been taught this by some man. Uh, for instance, he hadn't learned it from Peter or some of that nature. But he says this was revealed to him directly by Christ through revelation. And yet the author of the book here of Hebrews suggests that, uh, that, that what he knows he gained as information from other people that was delivered to him. And so that's why they say that Paul could not have written this book. Uh, but I'm fond of quoting sometimes, and I think about this, uh, quoting uh, someone that, that, that some of you will know, some of you won't, uh, Leo, Lee Corso. How many of you know Lee Corso? Uh, yeah. If you watch much of college football, he's on there along with Others uh, hand these games, and, and they're discussing who they think is going to win the game and why and so forth. And they'll go through all of this. And Lee, Lee Corso is usually one of the last ones to speak. And, and he'll say, well, you know what you said about this, this. But usually he'll always say, not so fast, friend. In other words, he's got something to say that seems to contradict what you believe for. And, and I think we have to recognize at least the possibility that when the author made these statements here, uh, that, that he makes these statements that we have here in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 2 and verse 3 especially, that he may have simply been identifying himself with the people he's writing to. Uh, sometimes we do that. You know, uh, you know, sometimes a person might stand up here and say, we who are older, and it might be a person saying that's not an older person, uh, but maybe doing that to identify uh, with his, his, his group, his audience. And there are times when you'll see that in the Bible. You'll see that in the writing of Paul. Uh, and we'll notice some of that. But first of all, in, in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, 1 and 3, 1 through 3, it says, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. One of the things that he's doing in this letter is, is emphasizing to these people who are on the verge of going back to that old religion of Judaism uh, and leaving Christianity. And he's trying to encourage them not to do that. 
but he identifies with them by saying, let us go on to perfection. That doesn't say, if Paul's the author, you know, uh, would he say something like that? Uh, or again, you know, going beyond these things, and then he says, this we will do if God permits. So he's identifying himself among, with them as one who's in the danger of going back to that old religion. But we're going to not do that. We're, we're going to get beyond these first things uh, that he enumerates there. And he says, we'll do this if God wills. So again, would Paul have written something like that? Would he? Well, it's a possibility he would. Because we have examples of Paul doing that. Uh, one passage I wanted to look at, 1 Thessalonians 4, 15 to 17. Definitely written by the Apostle Paul. And yet look what he says. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Two different times the author here, which is Paul, identifies himself with people saying, we who are alive when Christ... Did Paul really believe that he was going to be alive when Christ came back? You know, the Bible teaches us that no man knows when he's coming back. So Paul would not have known if he's coming, when he's coming back or not, or if he would be alive when he came back. But I think he's identifying with people. whoever it is that's alive when Jesus returns, he wants those people to know you're not going to precede those who've already died. But he identifies with them by saying, we who are alive. So sometimes Paul does that. And it may be that Paul has written the book of Hebrews, and in writing this book, he is simply identifying with other people and saying that we have received this, you know, uh, in the way that he talks about, that it's been confirmed to us by those who heard Jesus. Maybe simply identifying himself with the majority of the people he's writing to. Because uh, the majority of those people there had not learned directly from Christ. Uh, and so he may just be identifying with them and say, we've not done that. Well, that's at least a possibility that it could be talking about here. Uh, and so, you know, that might be, you know, uh, a reason not to reject the possibility of Paul's authorship. And one other thing that I mentioned was when we quoted from Origen, and Origen had made the statement, you know, that those of old, now Origen, you know, he's not a, a day of, of modern times for us. Origen lived sometime, around, I think, around the 3rd century uh, A.D. And he says, those who are old, not those who are old in times, uh, so that's got to put it back beyond him. Uh, he says of those people, they believe that Paul's the author of it. And he says that's one reason why a lot of people will accept it. And, uh, and so, you know, I think there's still the possibility, and sometimes I will say, uh, Paul said here, and then quote from Hebrews, well, I believe that Paul very well may have written the book. I couldn't prove it. Uh, and, and, you know, I don't make a big deal out of that. But I just think, you know, there is that possibility uh, that he is the author of the book. And that gives, I think, uh, one reason why more people are willing to accept uh, the things that are said this, believing that it is from Paul. But whoever it's from, it's from someone that's been inspired of God. And so that what we have here are things that we can trust, knowing that it comes from God, whether it comes through uh, Paul or whether it comes through some other individual. Uh, it's something that comes from God, and we can trust what it has to say. So anyhow, that, that's all about the authorship of it. Now, very quickly, I want to look at some other things by way of introduction to this book. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about here is the date of the book. You know, most times when you look at any of these books, kind of introduction of any kind, they're going to deal with this. Uh, there's nothing specifically said in the book as to the date of it, but a lot of the internal evidence in the book suggests that the book's written at a time when the temple was still standing uh, and, and the priests were still carrying on worship of God in the temple. So that would have made it, you know, before A.D. 70 uh, that this book would have been written. And again, a lot of liberal scholars want to take a lot of the things you have in the New Testament and date that much later. Uh, you know, to indicate this is not something that came from inspired men. But uh, just some of the things that are mentioned. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 8. Uh, 
Do we read here? Here mortal men receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. So he's making a distinction between under the old law and the new law. And under that new law, he talks about that mortal men receive tithes, present tense. So at the time he's writing the book, this book, these mortal men, these priests, are still receiving tithes from the Jewish people. But in contrast to that, he talks about Christ, uh, uh, of whom it is wit- he receives them, of whom it is witness that he lives. And so that would indicate this is a time prior to the destruction of Jerusalem. Uh, another passage, this time given in the book of Hebrews, in chapter 9, verses 6 through 10. Uh, I'll just read that very briefly here. Uh, it says, Now when these things have been thus prepared, the priest always went into the first part of the tabernacle, performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, which he offered for himself and for the people's sins, committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regard to the conscience. Concerning only with foods and drinks, various washings and fleshly ordinances imposed until the time of Reformation. Especially there in verse 9, he says that what was done in in regard to the worship at the temple, he said it was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts and sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect. That's talking about the continual sacrifices being made by the priest at the temple. At this present time, he says, they're doing that, which cannot make the people that come perfect. And so we know, we understand that those sacrifices made under the old law could not make men perfect. But evidently it was going on at the same time that the writer of the book wrote the book. And so again, it's something that emphasizes uh, the time period. It would have been before A.D. 70 when the temple would have been destroyed. Also, someone turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and, and verse 13. Uh, you want to do that uh, because he mentions something here uh, that has, still has to pass away. Who's got that for us? Uh, Hebrews 8, verse 13. All right, go ahead, Billy. <clears throat> okay, it's ready to vanish away. It hasn't vanished away yet, but it's ready to vanish away. And so, again, that temple, which was going to be destroyed, evidently was still there at that time. And so, again, just from the internal evidence, it looks like the book is written sometime prior to A.D. 70. It's not the work of some later time of some other author, uh, not recognized uh, as being one of God, of being an inspired man. <clears throat> then the last thing we'll look at in regard to the, just the introduction, the audience. And that's sort of who is he writing this letter to? Well, uh, we don't know for sure who he's writing it to. We say, well, look at it. It's time here, the letter to the Hebrews. Well, that wasn't part of the original uh, letter. That's something that was added later by men. Again, though, I think if you read the book carefully, you'll notice there are a lot of times uh, that it, it's clear that he's writing to Jewish people. But we don't know which ones. And again, just like with the authorship, there have been a lot of different ideas that have been suggested. Some suggest that this book was written to the Christ, Jewish Christians living in Jerusalem. Uh, others say it was written to the Jewish Christians who had been priests under the old Mosaical system. Because there are things that he's going to say here about these priests and everything that, that indicates he might be talking directly to them. Uh, others believe it was written to the Jewish com- community at Alexandria. Uh, that's down in, in, uh, in Africa, uh, in the city of, of Alexandria there had a large Jewish population. They had a large synagogue there. Uh, and it was there that the Old Testament was translated into the Greek language that we have today, the, the Septuagint. And so some believe that's who he's writing to, is to those Jews down in that place. Others believe it was written to the Jewish community at Qumran. Uh, if you're familiar with the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls uh, that we have been discovered, they show evidence talking about this community at Qumran of the Jewish people that live there. And some believe that's who this book is written to. Well, 
It, we don't really know. Uh, there's no evidence to it. But I think it is clear that he's writing to Jewish people, and especially to Jewish people who have become Christians. Uh, but I'll just mention this. There have been some who suggested that the book was written to the Gentile Christians. And the reason why is because in, in chapter 3, in, in verse 12, you want to look, look at that very quickly. Chapter 3 and verse 12. Someone read that for us. <laughs> okay. Now here's the argument that's made from that. If a Jew has become a Christian and, and he leaves the Christian religion, what's he going to do? In all likelihood, what's he going to do? He's going to return to his Jewish heritage. And, and, and who do the Jews believe in? They believe in some dead God? No, they believe in the living God. So some suggest, you know, this, this would not fit a Jewish person. If a Jew falls away after becoming a Christian, he's not going to really fall away from the living God. He's still going to believe in Jehovah God and, and going to serve Him under the Jewish law. So they say it must be talking about the Gentiles. Uh, the Gentiles, if they leave Christ, uh, they're in all likelihood are going to go back to their old way of life, which was worshiping idols. They would be falling away from the living God and serving dead gods. Well, that, that's usually what's being said. That's the argument that's made in regard to that. Uh, but there's some, some reasons for believing that, that that's not really true. Uh, if a person falls away from Christianity, he's fallen away from the only one that can save him. He's fallen away from Christ. And in falling away from Christ, you've fallen away from God because Christ is God. So even if it's a Jew, if he leaves Christianity, he's falling away from the living God because the only way you can serve God today is through Christ. You can't serve Him today through the old law and be accepted to Him. It's got to be through Christ. So if you fall away from Christ, you have indeed fallen away from the living God. Uh, you may be still professing to believe in Him and to serve Him, but you're not serving Him through Christ, which is the only way that, that can be accepted. Okay, that, that's very quickly just looking at some of the things about the books. Uh, through it all, though, we've got to say, we don't really know for sure who wrote it. We don't really know for sure to whom he wrote it. But we can be sure of the fact that what's written here is the Word of God. It is words that are inspired by God, given unto people, and therefore we can trust it. And therefore, in trusting what this book says, we know we can learn and profit by it and be given aid in living the way God wants us to live. So, Let's begin looking then at the book, at the text itself. Uh, and, and one of the things we want to notice here is, again, the whole book really is going to deal in great deal with the superiority of Christ and of the religion uh, that Christ has given to us. So in chapter 1, uh, we're going to begin looking at verses 1 through 3, which is going to deal with Christ being superior to the prophets. Uh, now this passage is very familiar to any of you who've ever used Jerry's book in teaching other people. Uh, but the text says that God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom also He made the worlds, who being the brightness of His glory and the express image of His person, and upholding all things by the word of His power, when He had by Himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So God formally, as he begins to talk about it, had used the prophets as his messengers to the people. Now, we talked a little bit about this last time, about prophets. And, and again, though, what is a prophet? Yeah, one who speaks forth for God. Right, from God's hand. Uh, and that prophet, you know, uh, sometimes say forth telling. Uh, and that's more what it means, forth-telling, telling forth the Word of God, but sometimes it will involve foretelling. A lot of times prophets are telling things that are going to happen in the future. 
But the basic idea behind a, a prophet is foretelling. So God used these prophets as a means of teaching people back then. God's message came to that prophet, uh, and that prophet then preached that message to the people. And so he's giving forth to them God's word, and that's what God did in times past. He directed his words to the people through these prophets, giving it to them. Now, there were a lot of great prophets under, under the Old Testament. We mentioned last week the first prophet mentioned in the Bible, the first person called a prophet was who? Abraham. Genesis chapter 20 and verse 7. He's the first man that we know of that's called a prophet. But there's so many great prophets. Moses was a great prophet of God. And there's something special about him as a prophet of God. And what's that? He is, he's likened unto a, a, another prophet. Who's that? No. He's the prophet like Christ. Christ is God who had made the promise. He's bringing up from them another prophet like unto Moses. Uh, and the things that are given there in the book of Deuteronomy about it, uh, you'll see that, that Moses was a type of Christ very much. And the role of prophet much like Christ. Uh, he was a great lawgiver. Jesus was a great lawgiver. Moses used many miracles that God gave to him to deliver the people of Israel from Egypt to get them to the promised land. Uh, Christ's ministry is filled with miracles that he did uh, that are like that. Uh, God knew Moses in a special way. What was that? What was so special about the relationship between God and Moses? All right, face to face. You know, God knew Moses face to face. Well, it's the same way with Jesus. Jesus had that close relationship to God. Uh, in John chapter 1, in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And that expression in the Greek, was with God, literally was right up to God. Uh, and again, it's almost that idea of being face to face. And God said, that's the way I am with Moses. You know, uh, it's not like with others. God said, I'm, I speak with Moses face to face. And so there's that likeness. He, he is a type of Christ. There's a likeness between him as a prophet. But you look in the Old Testament, just countless numbers of prophets that are given to us. Uh, you've got prophets like Elijah and Elijah, who, who are referred to as non-literary prophets. They didn't write any books. Uh, we don't have anything in the, in the Bible, any books written by them. But then you've got a lot of others. Uh, you look at what we call the, the major prophets. You've got Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and Daniel and Ezekiel uh, that wrote books that we have from them about God and about the things that God had foretold through them and what's going to happen and how he used them. Then you've got the 12 minor prophets. But then there's so many other times you have mention of prophets in the Old Testament. We're, we're not told their name. We're just told about a prophet of God, you know, uh, being used by God to bring a message to the people. And so those prophets were essential uh, in, in that old law of getting God's message out to people. And that's what God did, he says, in the past. God, at various times, in various ways, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. That's the way it was. But what is it today? Uh, mentioned these guys. In these last days... He's spoken to us through who? Through His Son. And so there is a new prophet that God is using. Uh, but He's not just a prophet. He's also a high priest. And He's also a Savior. He's also a king. And so God has this individual now that He's going to be using to talk to people. And He does that in the last days. Now, what are the last days that He's talking about? Right now? What, what, I, you know, what do most people think of when they hear the last days? The end of time. Uh, but the last days, it, it can either refer to uh, the last dispensation of time, which would be the Christian dispensation in which we're living today, or it could be talking about the end of the Mosaical dispensation. You know, so 
you know, God in times past uh, spoke to the people through those prophets, but now in the last days, He's spoken to us through His Son. Jesus came at the end of the Mosaical age. Uh, so that, it may have a reference to that, or it may be like uh, Ansel said, talking about the time we're living in now. We're living in the last days. In the sense, we're living in the last dispensation of time, Christianity. Uh, not necessarily meaning the, the very end of time. So it's in these last days that God speaks to us through His Son. He began that at the end of the Mosaical age, but He's still doing it today. He's speaking to us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we need to keep that in mind that we today are not following that old law, but we're listening to Christ. Someone looked at Matthew 17. And again, this is a passage familiar to every one of us, but I'd like somebody to read the first five verses there of Matthew 17. Darnell, please. Okay. Two people appear with Jesus here on that occasion to talk about Jesus' coming death. Uh, first of all, he mentioned there's Moses. He talked about Moses. He's the great lawgiver. Uh, that Old Testament law, uh, the, those first five books were written uh, at God's direction by Moses, inspired to write those books. That's the, the law that God's given to his people. Uh, and then there's Elijah. And for many of the Jews, Elijah was the great prophet of the Old Testament. And, uh, and so, here are these two men, one representing the law, one representing the prophets that are appearing there with Jesus. And Peter's so excited about this. You couldn't have found two greater men from the Old Testament, you know, uh, for a Jewish person to be able to see. Uh, and, and he sees that. And so his first thought, we need to build three tents to honor each of these men. We need to build one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. One for the law, one for the prophets, and one now for the Son of God. And God chose to speak from heaven. And God said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Listen to Him. The time for listening to Moses and the prophets as the guide for our life and what we're to do and how to serve God is past. And now we've got to listen to Jesus. And that's exactly what the Hebrew writer is saying. God spoke in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, but now in these last days, He's spoken to us through His Son. And so Christ is the one that we need to listen to. And so Jesus is superior to these prophets. He has superseded them because He's superior to them. Uh, and in what ways is He superior? Well, look at something. Number one, Jesus is the heir of all things. He mentions that here uh, in verse 2. But in these last days he's spoken to us by a son whom he appointed the heir of all things. Christ is the one to inherit all things. Uh, again, uh, well, I think I have put this verse up here. No, I didn't. All right, someone turn to Psalms chapter 2 for us. Psalms 2 and verse 8. Who's got that passage for us? You can read that. Psalms 2 and verse 8. All right, go ahead. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. Okay. This is one of the Messianic Psalms that he's writing to, and God's making this promise to him. He says, Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. Now, he's the heir to receive this from God, and he says, The ends of the earth for your possession. Well, God had always intended, you know, that this would be for Christ. Now, to gain that, he had to go through the cross. He had to live that life of obedience to God. Uh, Satan offered to give it to him, give him all the kings of the world. If he'd fall down and worship him, uh, you know, but Satan didn't own those kingdoms. Uh, God did. And God's the one who promised it to Christ. Christ would be the heir to receive that from God. And so he's superior now to these prophets, because he's the heir of all things. 
Uh, he's also superior to the prophets because he's the one that created all things. Uh, I mentioned a while ago, John chapter 1, I begin at verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things by Him were made which have been made, and apart from Him there was not anything made which has been made. And so Christ created everything. That shows His superiority to those prophets. Uh, you know, the, the, the Bible later on is going to talk about uh, Moses, you know, Moses being a servant in the house of God, but Jesus being the head of that house. And so, you know, he is superior to them. He's the one that's created everything. He's the one that created that house uh, that, that they have there. Then next he says, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. And that's been, you know, that's kind of a uh, strange saying here in, in Hebrews chapter 1. Uh, Verse 3 says he reflects the glory of God and bears the very stamp of his nature. Well, again, there's evidence given to us in the Bible in regard to that. Uh, again, in the book of John chapter 1, it's introduced that. Come down to verse 14. And what does verse 14 say? And we beheld what? His glory. And we beheld His glory, glory as the only begotten of the Father. He's talking about Jesus there. And, and He says, we beheld His glory, and it's the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And so Jesus, you know, bears that radiance of God. He, he is an image of God in His nature. Uh, and that's the very next thing He mentions. Jesus is the express image of God's nature. Uh, the prophets were great men. But all the prophets could do was tell people about God. They could not show them God. But with Jesus, it's different. You remember one time when uh, Thomas, uh, was it Thomas, I believe, that said, you know, uh, or no, Philip, said uh, to Jesus, show us the Father. And what did Jesus tell him? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You know, so he's the express image of God's nature. And so he is superior to the prophets for that very reason. He is one that we have. Uh, let's see here. He upholds all things by the word of his power. Again, that's what he expresses here and talks about it. Upholding the universe by his word of power. Uh, again, we talked about it. Jesus is the one that created everything. Uh, he is the creator of all this thing. Not only did he create it, He's the one who, by that same power, keeps it going. Uh, you know, I hear people talk about, you know, the, uh, that man is going to destroy this world. Uh, you know, that we're, we're not treating this world right, and we may not be, but it's not within the power of man to destroy this world. God's the one who will do that. Christ created it, and, and He'll be the one uh, to keep it going. As long as He desires to keep it going, it'll be kept going. And in the end, it will be destroyed by God. Uh, next, he says, Jesus made purification of our sins. And this is something so extremely important. That's the last part there in, in the verse. Uh, it says, when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Christ did something for us that none of the prophets could ever do. You know, the prophets could teach us the will of God. But the prophets couldn't do anything to purify us. Uh, man could make those sacrifices that were called upon that the, the prophets could tell them about. Moses gave them all of these different sacrifices they were going to have to do. But that didn't purify them. That didn't really take away their sins. It, it simply you know, caused the, the, those sins to be remembered year after year after year. And it wasn't until Christ came. Now that Christ, by the offering of Himself as the perfect sacrifice, shedding His blood, that sins were finally taken away. And the Hebrew writer will talk about that later uh, in the book, uh, that that's how we are purified by sins. It's through Christ. So He's superior to the prophets in that regard. Billy? Yeah, Right, that's in chapter 9 and verse 22. Then you get to chapter 10 and verse 4. He said it's not possible 
for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. And so it was going to take the, the sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God, that's of Jesus. And so Jesus could purify us of sin. He could get rid of all of those sins that we have. So these are all things that show here that evidence the fact that Jesus is superior to those prophets, as great as those men were. Uh, and then he mentions the fact that Jesus is at the right hand of God. Now that's the last thing it says here. Uh, when he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is now ruling over his kingdom. Uh, he is over that kingdom of heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 25 says of Jesus, For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. So he's reigning right now. And he must continue to reign till all of his enemies have been put under his feet. Uh, and the fact that it says here that he sat down at the right hand of God suggests what? All right, he's on the throne, the ruling, on the throne of David. All right, the right hand of authority there that he has for that. But also suggests the idea of his having completed his work. Uh, he can sit down now. Now, he doesn't stand again until what? Now, there's one example, at least in the Bible. When Stephen was stoned to death, and Stephen said, I see the heavens open, and the Son of God, what? Standing. You know, uh, and that's always been a comfort to me to know that when, when bad things are happening to God's people, He's not ignorant of that. Uh, he is alert to it, and He's concerned about it, that He's gotten up to go over and to look down on what's happening to His people. But the fact that when He went back, He sat down at the right hand of God, so He's completed His work. We talked about then in the lesson, uh, the sixth word of Jesus from the cross, it is finished. Uh, he's completed the work that God's given to do. So all these things were given here in these first few verses to emphasize to us that though God did speak in the past through the prophets, and they were great men, great servants of God, now in these last days He speaks to us through His Son, and His Son is superior to all those prophets. And that's one of the reasons, again, why we need to listen to Jesus, uh, because of the superiority of who He is. Uh, now, the next thing we'll all have to do is just kind of get introduced to this before time's gone. But Jesus also is superior to the angels. Chapter 1, beginning at verse 4, and going through chapter 2 and verse 18, it's emphasized the superiority of Christ uh, to the angels. Now, we're just going to look uh, very briefly here at verses 4 and 5. It says, Having become so much better than the angels, as he has an inheritance, obtained a more excellent name, than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son? Today I have begotten you, and again I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. So the beginning here emphasizing the superiority of, of Christ to the angels. Now when you think of angels, what do you think of? What's that? <laughs> Okay, talked about his, the wings and the glowing. Uh, well, they're heavenly beings, uh, and, and they're, uh, they're powerful beings. You know, you see that in examples we've talked about, one angel killing a, you know, a hundred and, what was it, 180,000 180, uh, Syrian soldiers. Uh, they're powerful, and every time you have the appearance of angels to people in the Bible, it seems like it always causes fear in the people. Uh, they know they're, they're, they're in the presence of these powerful beings. And yet, Christ is superior to the angels. And, and there's several things that he mentions through, through these two verses, and, and we'll see more later as we go through chapter uh, 2. Uh, but number one, it puts uh, he's better than angels because he has an inheritance obtained by inheritance, and obtained a more excellent name than they. Uh, and if you stop just to think about the name that's been given to Christ, uh, well, just his title is Christ. What does that mean? The anointed one. Uh, and so what does that suggest? 
But you look in the Old Testament, what was anointing used for? Besides healing, now. Bestowing power. Uh, you anointed those who were to be king. They would be anointed with oils. You anointed those who were being made prophets uh, to serve them. And you anointed the priest. Well, guess what? Jesus is both prophet, priest, and king. But he's been given a name, uh, anointed one, that's above every name that's ever been given. But the same thing's true of the name uh, of Jesus that he's been given. Uh, let's see it. Philippians 2 and verse 9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. Doesn't matter what name you think of, if you live, you think of that anyone has been been blessed with. You know, God gave Abraham a new name, Abraham. He gave uh, Jacob a new name, Israel, uh, Prince of God. But listen, it doesn't matter what that name is. Jesus has a name above all of those names, uh, and the name Jesus itself means Jehovah saves. Uh, but He has a name because of that. It's His name that is attached to this idea of salvation. Acts 4 and verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. There's no other name. You, you think of any great individual in the Bible that's ever lived, uh, and, and you're not going to find anybody that has a name by which we're to be saved. That belongs to Jesus only. Uh, the very Son of God. So he's superior for the, of the angels for that reason. Well, there's several other things that he talks about that we'll get into hopefully next week. Uh, but our time's gone. Let's uh, have a brief word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we're so thankful and grateful to Thee for Your love for us in this life, for giving to us Your Son Jesus to die, that He could provide for us that purification of sins that no one else could ever do. Grateful, Father, that we have Jesus as our our Lord, our High Priest, also as our Prophet, our King, and our Savior. And we pray, Father, you would help us to understand how great Christ is, superior to the prophets and the angels, and that we, Father, will put our complete trust in Him. Bless us through this week and keep us near Thee and help us to always look to Thee and to Christ for the guidance we need in this life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.